This is off planet radio. Everybody, welcome to Our Planet Radio, Our Planet TV in the new year 2018. Welcome to the show. Uh, if you're seeing this on YouTube, hearing the podcast on the website at ourplanetradio.com or over the um, iTunes feed, you may notice a slight difference. This will be a one hour show for um, our general listeners out there. And uh, the second hour will be available on our members only Patreon site at uh, patreon.com forward slash off planet media and uh for not a lot of money we're hopefully going to give you a whole bunch of content in 2018 this show is brought to you by the very same people who are part of patreon and they make it possible you can be part of that too and we welcome you to the show got a great show lined up for tonight we're going to step into the year with some forecasting robert phoenix is with us We've got a group of people here as well that are going to participate. They are part of our Patreon group as well. So membership does have its privileges, it's just like American Express. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Emily's going to bring us into the, uh, the dugout for the lineup tonight. And with that, we kick it off 2018. Hey, Em, welcome. Hello. Welcome back, everybody. Happy New Year. Glad to be at doing the first show of the year. And also thank you to everybody who had a lot of nice uh, things to say about our year-end show. We really appreciate those compliments. And um, yeah, so uh, Happy New Year. And um, it's only taken nine days and Randy has picked up a new troll. So everybody <laughs> congratulate Randy on picking up quite a troll today. Yeah, so we, we continue to piss people off at a rapid rate. Yeah. 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 And um, yeah, it's just wanted to, uh, again, um, Thank the patrons. Um, and uh, we're going to do, um, so we're super excited to have Robert here for the first show of the year. Robert's our favorite guest. We, lo we love all of our guests, but Robert's special. And we're going to uh, break down some current events for you guys in the first, uh, first half hour. And then we're going to do some readings. Um, for the first time, Robert's done that for us on air here. And so we're super excited about that. And then in the second hour, he will be making a forecast and some predictions kind of, aim, you know, special for our off-planet radio crowd so we're excited about that so let's get it going man robert phoenix welcome back to off-planet radio what is going on oh hey always my pleasure to be here with you uh emily and randy thanks for having me and happy new year to everybody yeah absolutely it's been a chilly start to the new year for everywhere except for here but now it's raining here so you guys are done freezing in texas at least huh apparently the freeze is off for now <laughs> And yeah. The the, uh, the bomb cyclone has uh, done its damage. It was so pretty I think cold here. we got down into the teens. Uh, so that's uh, for this part of Texas. It's it, that's pretty cold. Ooh, I like that your assistant has joined us. Which assistant is this? Uh, this is this is Jasper. Jasper. And Jasper, uh, he's a media whore. He loves to come on. Cat <laughs> so. after my own heart. Yeah, my cat. Yeah. Does, my cat does some of that. Right on. So, so the ice age is off for now and global warming is back on, huh? Yes. Well, I don't know, you know, there are, pe <laughs> there are people who, it's so funny because it, it, it really speaks to the, the bifurcation or the, per, the multi, the multi -per bifurcation, the fractalization, fractalization of the world that we're living in today. Because even when you get into what we would call the, the truth or the red pill, sort of sector of our, our culture, you can't even get two people to kind of agree on a standard, right? Us, because there's one sort of faction that says, well, we're at a solar minimum. And when we're in the solar minimum, all the temperatures go way down and there is cyclical precedent for the solar minimum. You and think they're creating a solar minimum by blocking the sun with the bullshit they spray in the sky? Not, well, no, there, I mean, I think that that's a separate issue. Yeah. Okay. But if you if you look at the solar minimum, it goes all the way back to the fall of Rome and the the storming of um, Germania by the Huns, who in turn storm 
Rome, the Goths. The Goths, yeah. Like, how and, very fitting that is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and so we see the end of Rome during that solar minimum. And then what happens is, <coughs> excuse me, is that there's, that's also the beginning of the Dark Ages in Europe. And the Dark Ages are both metaphoric and they're also quite real in the sense that the temperatures in Europe at that time were quite frigid. You really couldn't grow anything. There was just not a lot of population uh, happening. There's no population explosion. There's no economy. Uh, a lot of the the knowledge of the Greeks, to some extent the Romans, were encapsulated in these cathedral schools, which were almost like fortresses and these little seeds of light that would then the, literally burst when the Dark Ages would both metaphorically and literally end. And then we have the blossoming of culture and uh, ultimately the Renaissance in Europe. And that all has to do with sunlight and heat. Now there's also another part of that solar minimum that's connected to, to plagues. And there is a, uh, another kind of downturn and down cycle, which takes place right around the time that the rats came to Constantinople, which was the, the, out, the outpost of Rome that did outlive Rome for quite a period of time. And that, that plague, one of the first great plagues of Europe, um, took out Constantinople. At that time, it was just it, so. There's also this connection between uh, the solar minimum. You had and, it better for a like, second. You, you had the camera better for a second, and then you moved uh, it. Yeah, again. Yes, uh, my, a little more. That. We can't see your face. Now we can see you. That's better. Okay, yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah. There. So, so um, my my familiar decided he wanted to love up the uh, the monitor. Anyway, so so we're so there there is evidence. There's like historical evidence that we're in a solar minimum, which means a downturn in the climate. Now, again, in the red pill community, you'll have people that will say, well, the, the core of the earth is heating up and the sun has nothing to do with everything. It's just basically a light bulb out there. And so this is where the real global warming is taking place. It's happening inside the earth. So even in the, in the sort of the truth community or the red pill world, people came and agree on the sort of where we're headed, whether it's a global warming, which is not based, has nothing to do with, with um, an excess of carbon, carbon in the atmosphere. Um, and then you have this solar minimum. And then there's a third piece, which is really compelling in a lot of ways, is that the, the ocean beds and the permafrost are starting to release this methyl sulfide. Uh, and the methyl sulfide is what's causing um, the, the mass fish die off. But not only that, it's getting into the atmosphere and is creating events that are connected to spontaneous combustions. Uh, and, and these fires that are exploding all over the place, especially in your coastal areas, are linked to the rise of methyl sulfide. Interesting. Now, so that's a whole other kind of, you know, apocalyptic scenario that we're, you know, that we're, we're chewing on. And the volcanic activity, which is quite significant, by the way, is also connected to this rise in methyl sulfide. And there's other components. Apparently, these pockets of methyl sulfide um, will come in and take place. And they, they will literally form these, these clouds, these little pockets and clouds. And when that happens and people sort of get a very strong whiff of this stuff, they turn into zombie-like characters. And oh. these, these are the face eaters. These are the people that go nuts, right? You've seen, we've all seen the video. That's interesting because that was also in a coastal area. Most, most of that was happening in Florida. That's right. right. Yeah. That's, that's right. So the, 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 uh, the common wisdom here is to get off the coasts. Well, it would, I mean, it would explain a lot of the kind of behavior you see on the boardwalk on Venice Beach and some things like that as well. Like there's some, we see some weird stuff over there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, yeah. right. So, so now we, so we've got all these different scenarios going on. And then of course we have the, the aerosol spraying that's taking place in the sky. It has been for the last 20 years. So why are they doing that? You know, is, is it a slow kill? Is it, I mean, the dimming of the light. I mean, there's, I think what they're trying to do, and I've shifted, and not to say that I think chemtrails are this benevolent thing, because clearly it has an impact on us, and there's, you know, all these other kinds of undercurrents with chemtrails and experimentation that's going on, but I think they're trying to delay something, 
-hmm. and they've been trying to delay this for a long time. You think and, they're trying to delay something or they're trying to block us from seeing something else that's going on? Maybe them. that's part of it too. I think there's yeah. a delay. I think what they're yeah. trying to do, I think they're trying to elongate um, a particular um, you know, vector so that they can figure out what the hell they're going to do for the planet. And everything else might be a part of that as well. You yeah. know, we can't see what's going on, you know, with the dimming of the sky and, you know, the, maybe there's two suns out. I mean, there's plenty, there's plenty of, of, of because it's cloaked, right? It's a yeah. cult. Of, the sky is a cult of, with, with. Yeah, the that's activity. exactly it. Yeah. Have the, so, is the kids spraying where you are lower too? Like it's gotten really low here. Yeah, it's low. I mean, they're, yeah. it's not like they're, they've got the, you know, the big tankers way up there. No, yeah, it's, it's, low. it's definitely low. And, and it's every single day now. Every single day. And this, and they, they do this cyclically. And I believe it's a north-south sort of trade-off. And in the, in the fall, they come back to the northern hemisphere. And we'll be up in the northern hemisphere um, roughly from fall to like um, mid-spring. Yeah, yeah. So April. April. It seems to be on a six-month kind of, yeah. Yeah, and then they leave. And then they go to the southern hemisphere. Yeah. And then they, they start to spray in the southern hemisphere. So we get, we get a bit of a break. But the, the, I won't, the thing that always blew my mind about, about chemtrails is just the amount of material that they have to create for this stuff. Yep. Right? I mean, just think about that. It's a huge amount of material. Like, where is that being created? Or, or do they do the thing like they do with the fluoride, where they're dumping materials from other things? They're, they're using things that are waste from other things as the product for this. You still have to accumulate it somewhere. Yeah. You, yeah. you still have to put that together, right? Yeah. And then you have to create uh, um, um, a, a suspension of some sort and then, then distribute it. And that's the other thing, too. So there's this massive you know, production and distribution network of these chemicals that's take that are taking I place. think a large part of it's going on in Casa Grande Arizona which uh, between F uh, Tucson and Phoenix it's where the evergreen is Yeah that's where evergreen yeah. is yep Are they still are they still in business are they still yeah. evergreen yeah Yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I yeah and there it's so it's just a little bit above the Marana Air Force Base the Marana Air Force Base, like so there's Tucson and then Marana and the Mar Air Force Base is in Marana and then there's Casa Grande where Evergreen is and then there's like Tempe. And I used to see this, that had some of the heaviest activity I ever saw was between Phoenix and Tucson. Yeah, well, I came, I came flying into Phoenix one time on a Southwest Airlines flight and the Southwest Airlines plane or jet that I was on was actually laying chemtrails. Of course, yeah. I, was, I flew into Phoenix uh, in 2010 paralleling um we were circling into phoenix and at one point above us probably about another maybe 1500 feet up in the up in the sky was a chemtrailing plane flying right beside us just bailing this shit out and it was yeah. an evergreen plane yeah it was that close that you could see it yeah so, you know, about, and people have asked about this. I, somebody on Facebook had asked about where is the funding coming from for this? Because it's obviously an extremely expensive operation. And I, again, you know, it's all speculation, but they're, the black budgets are being funded out, out of the, the missing money that has so famously disappeared so many times from the military budgets. That's right, seven trillion dollars. Because this is a military operation. At, at, you know, the subcontractors like Evergreen, and there's there's about a dozen contractors that are that are involved in this that, that I'm aware of. They're all being paid out of out of funds that are basically sequestered under under military jurisdiction. Well, and then also just just uh, you know black black operations, the drug dealing operations, the heroin and the meth and the cocaine and stuff like that. All, that's all. I mean, I would. I think probably there's some similar uh, chemical and processing in, some, in dealing with some of the drugs as there are in dealing with some of these things. So I think some of the, you know, I think there's some, uh, like they used to use the drug money for weapons and whatever, and I think now probably they use some of it for this kind of stuff as well. Yeah, I think that that's probably that's probably true. Of course, the cart. So do you, do you, have you heard the the rumor that that the head of the cartels in North America is Warren Buffett. Have you heard that rumor? Do you know about that mm -hmm. story? I've heard that. I've, that's been rumbled about, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, and so I, that you, was that's not real surprising given the level of success and the fact that Berkshire Hathaway looks like a friendly face to park money behind. Absolutely. Given, well, and doesn't, a, doesn't, doesn't Warren Buffett own Dairy Queen? Yes, he does. Absolutely. So that would be an I mean I, that would be an interesting way of laundering a lot of that money as well, right? Well, he owns a ton. He, has, he owns a ton of companies, insurance companies, insurance companies, companies, real right. estate, vast real estate holdings. But fast and, food places are, partic are particularly good for laundering money because yeah, it's whether, fast turnaround of cash. Yeah, and also yeah. because you see a lot of these Dairy Queens and stuff like that, you drive into these small towns and there's yeah. actually nobody. Now there. we're at the point where Dairy Queen is yeah. part of the cabal. Well, you know, remember, we, we've <laughs> sunk this low. Well, and he's, the, he's and, and he's the Dairy Queen. You always catch him eating his ice cream cone and whatever, right? But um, uh, remember in, in uh, Breaking Bad, the guy owns yeah. the, fr the fried chicken restaurants, right? That's right. And the, That's right. the um the the manuf the distribution center for some of the things for his restaurants was where they were actually processing the making the methamphetamine and shipping it out they were using that as a, a distribution center for that as well so you know i think that that's probably you know well, back to the and back to the materials for a minute let's bear in mind these materials while it does obviously processing these are classified as toxic materials these are basically waste much like the, 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 the whole gambit with fluoride, which was basically the industrial waste that was being slagged off. Fertilizer. Yeah, right? right, exactly, from Alcoa and all of these aluminum companies and the byproducts. And, and they were already dumping it in the water. And at some point, they figured out that not only could they avoid the steep fines that were going to come once they established the EPA, but they could actually turn this into a profit. That's these right. guys are always looking for money. Thanks to Bernays, Edward Bernays helped exactly. sell fluoride. Yeah. yeah, one of one of the many things, one of the many gifts he gave us while he was <laughs> roaming Sigmund the planet. Sigmund Freud's nephew, no less. Yeah, yeah, of yeah, course. Absolutely. Yeah. So before we get into the readings and stuff, since it's been a little bit of a topic and and whatever, and Randy's been rumbling about it a little on Facebook, and we were just chatting. You know, you were mentioning about the uh, the, the the flight logs to Gitmo. Um, you know, there's been, uh, you know, all of this stuff with the Q stuff. I've kind of taken the position that I'm not that interested in this Q. So, I mean, I, I monitor it, but um, I feel like we've seen stuff like this before and how much attention is being paid to it and how obsessed and sure of, sure of things people are with this is kind of uh, annoying and scary to me. Um, I liked that video that um, a, a dark journalist made with Joseph Farrell last night. Um, I thought that was a pretty good analysis of, of the Q stuff basically saying that there's some sort it's some kind of you know basically it's a it's a ploy being aimed at certain aspects of the alter certain elements of the alternative media and I like when they quoted uh, Catherine Austin Fitz as calling it hope porn that mm -hmm. fear porn had got they'd, they'd worn out the fear porn and it wasn't working so much anymore so now they're running hope porn on people and I thought that was a pretty you good know assessment. what I find funny about that whole position and I've not seen the Pharaoh interview yeah. I just became I aware it of it. Yeah. Okay, you sent it to me. Yeah. Um, do you remember listening to Joseph Farrell and Catherine, Catherine Austin Fitz right after Trump's election, where right. they were talking about Goldman Sachs and the fact that they felt that with Trump in office, they could probably use Goldman Sachs. So I, I have to think, first off, the tides turn somewhat with Farrell and Catherine Austin Fitz in terms of their perception of Trump. And then secondly, this infiltration into the alternative media becomes one of these guns pointed at everybody else's head kind of things, because the very same people that we look for credibility in were also, I'm sorry, but there are times when I've had to be deeply suspicious of the things dark journalists has been involved with. And frankly, Mrs. Fitz, as well as Joseph Farrell, it doesn't mean I think they're they're compromised in any way. I think this is the margin where opinions and concepts come into play and people get hardwired to things in a certain way. Oh, and then yeah. it gets spewed out in the media. And this is the problem with QAnon right now. Uh, that is highly cryptic information and embedded in it, there are some very fascinating factoids that are dangled. And it's done in such a way, and the semiotics are such, it leads me to believe that behind it, there lies a certain amount of leakage. But like everything else, it's become confabulated with a whole lot of other crap. 
that's cloaked in this, this political religious kind of jargon that's designed to appeal to a certain sector of the alt net Joseph, communities. Yeah. That's basically what Joseph Farrell and, and Daniel were talking about last night. That was you just pretty much summed up in a short way what they okay. were talking oh, about. Oh, good. We agree. And well, yeah. we didn't. Have, we don't have to listen to that interview because Randy just busted yeah. it. Out. But pretty I can much. do it. I can do it in two minutes. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm not. Oh, that's my of, ego. Oh, Joseph my troll Farrell. out there. Excuse me. I'm sorry. That was my ego erupting again. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, Robert. What were you saying? I'm not a fan of Joseph Farrell, by the way. I I, I just put. I I don't really. I don't really dig that guy. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, I, I have mixed, mixed. I think he's done some good work and then other things I'm just like, eh, he doesn't work for me. But this one was actually. Well, uh, again, you know, that's a platform. Yeah. There's a certain disposition to certain things that have been presented over a very long time in a series of books. The same with Cast Catherine Austin Fitz. I met her, I interviewed her out in Boulder in 2013. She didn't appreciate me a whole lot because I called her a whistleblower and she got very offended at that. Wow. But um, again, you have to parse what is data from what is a perspective and from what may even be an agenda at times. Well, I think, I think we all have some level of predisposition and inside, of, inside of us. What, what, I mean, Absolutely. And, I, and look, to your, to your credit, Randy, I think one of the things that makes you incredibly authentic is the fact that I think you monitor your predisposition rigorously. That's my sense about you. And, and, I, and I think you are, while you're in that process, you're, you're mining for something that is, I wouldn't say you're mining for the truth, but you're mining for something that is not fabricated, if you know what I mean. Right. I mean, that's what I get. From yeah. You. I, and truthfully, I've changed positions on things over the years. And it's, it's just an ongoing process. I think the longer you're in the media spotlight, and you know this as well, and Emily's, Emily's seeing this, there's an evolution that takes place in our perspectives, in our presentation and everything else. Yeah. And I even told the person on Facebook who came at me, I'm open to changing some or part of my position on QAnon, but you're going to have to justify your attack of my analysis with something more substantial than calling bullshit. Right. Well, also the thing that the the thing that concerns me most about this Q thing is how emotionally attached people have become to mm -hmm. it, and how how defensive people are. If you if you question it, they stay, it's kind of like the flat Earth thing, right? If you start questioning it, they they call you names and and start the accusations. Like nobody actually knows. Who, who or what this cue is. So to be emotionally attached to it, I find to be quite disturbing. That's a really good point. That's a really, I mean, and you might even make um, kind of a parallel analysis that that would be the same kind of uh, reaction and rhetoric you'd get from somebody on the left. Yes. And if, and if you would question, you know, the, the leftist or the progressive belief or didactic ideology, they would just shut you down. Yep. And that happens. And mm -hmm. you, very rarely can you have an open-ended and open-minded yeah. they, they never actually want to challenge your idea with a better idea and explain why their no, idea is better. By and large, yeah, you know, if the, the hard-boiled left just, just shuts down. And, you know, there's no, there's no bridge between two people that can have an op a really open discussion. And I think, that, I think you can see that kind of it's, it's a kind of fanaticism. Fanaticism. Yeah. Like, literally, there, there are people in the alternative media who I have appreciated, even though I don't agree with them necessarily about everything. I have appreciated a lot of their work for a, a long time. And I've watched some of them, in my opinion, over the course of the last four to six weeks, kind of, uh, what does Randy say, the cheese sliding off the cracker kind of thing with some of this, like the, uh, the, the way that they're being People are defending Trump and, and acting like he's some hero who's going to save things and how he's such a great, I mean, like, you know, that kind of stuff and how this Q thing, like, it's almost like this obsession with this thing having to happen the way that they fantasize that it's going to happen with arrests and, and with all this kind of stuff. It's, I find it quite disturbing. And I feel like some of these people have lost a little bit of touch with, with, um, Reality, even some people who I think have always been fairly, who I always consider to be fairly grounded researchers and analysts of information, they seem to have gotten a little carried away with this, in my opinion. 
Well, I, I think that that is part and parcel due to the fact that we've been dealing with these heinous crimes for, for a long time. And, and it's just coming to people's attentions in a more conspicuous fashion now than ever. Yeah. And what we, what we haven't had is, is we haven't had any, any real consequences for these crimes. Right. We, you, you, whether it's Wall Street, whether it's government, um, people, they walk, right? They walk, they step down. Um, when they're being questioned, they, yeah. they take the fifth. They don't, they don't answer any questions. Uh, so we have this backlog of almost, uh, it, it's bubbling up to a lynch mob mentality, to be honest with yes. you. Yes, yeah, no, I agree, yeah. Because yeah. people want blood. People want, it, people want to count some coup here. Because I don't, I don't think that's actually how we're going to fix this problem, though. I think that's actually, in some ways, that's a requ a, 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 like, um, like the kind of response that some of the powers that be are hoping for, right? Well, it didn't work, for, it didn't work during the French Revolution. Right. I mean, that's what yeah, they did. They fomented work. a revolution. Not going to work. And essentially, the Rothschilds got rid of all their competition. Yeah. I mean, I think the way that we deal with this, you know, it is by basically turning our backs on these people in this system, as opposed to, you know, going for the jugular and going for blood and wanting to treat that, you know, these people who like the idea of the politicians being sent to Gitmo and stuff like that. Like, I don't like, you know, I don't like that idea. So you just nailed something yeah, that I, I, I was think I, I was thinking about this. One of the things that we need to understand is that these people have been players their whole lives and, and, and bloodlines going back generations. I've proposed loosely what I call the ostracism matrix, yep. matrix, which is basically to cut them off of everything that gives them any sense of dignity or belonging to a society and any means of support beyond survival. Yeah, just, I think what you do is they, like- I don't think- Like I, shun it. I'm not shun one it. of these people. And this was the, the thing with people like what Drake was proposing, which was basically to line most of them up and shoot them or lock them into uh, underground prisons yeah, or to I'm bomb their this. bunkers. <clears throat> No new society that's based on humane values is going to seek vendetta. Yeah, we no. have to get past this. We have to walk away and create yes. something better ourselves, and and we can not we can you know, not allow them to participate in it. But I don't think that like the, just the the, the bloodlust that is in and I I get it like I you know but I just think that like we have to be in in creating the new paradigm that we would like to see we have to be really careful at the way we close out the old one because that is going to set so much of the energy and intention for how the new one sort of you know well, let me ask let me ask you a question do you think people should be held responsible for war crimes yeah i do think people should be held responsible for war crimes yeah okay. absolutely yeah okay. I, I think they so should I, be held i think that that's an important question yeah because there have been violations of human rights yeah, uh, that are egregious, and we're one of the greatest violators of that. Totally, I think I, I think there needs to. I mean, I'm I'm for, you know, there being trials and people and all and all that and people, you know, getting you know a certain kind of due punishment and and, and whatever. But I'm not for the I, this idea of let's just NDAA them and send them to Gitmo or do whatever. We didn't like the idea of having that done to to us the truth telling community. So I don't think that's the best way of handling this, but I do think there needs to be transparency about the truth, about what these people have done and, and, and they need to be held responsible. I don't know the best way for, I don't know the best way to do that yet, but I, I think we have to be really careful about the path we choose with this. I think, and I know a lot of people say, well, it's in the past now and we have to move on, but I just think we got to go back to 9-11. I agree hundred percent. You, yeah. you, you go back to 9-11, you cut the Gordian knot with 9-11. And yeah. you can find the perpetrators. They're still on the planet. They're still walking around. They're, they're still profiting from the death and destruction and the carnage. And not just that, but the mind lock. Yeah, the that mind was, lock. The mind lock more than anything. Yeah. That was put in place after 9-11 and the Patriot Act and TSA and DHS and, and all that stuff. And it should be disassembled. Absolutely. And, and, and going back into 9-11 and having a really thorough a clear independent investigation, which I don't think will ever happen. But that would, to me, that's where you would start. Yeah. And then untangle the whole thing because there are enough people that are connected to 9-11 that would, that would actually fit into the category 
of being convicted of war crimes and crimes against the United States of America. I think, I, I actually think in some ways, going back to Oklahoma City, it, it, it could, it could, it, I, I would maybe even include Oklahoma City in that. That's a little arcane. I mean, right. it is a little arcane. To yeah. go into Oklahoma City, you'd have to go into the Clinton administration. Right. And you'd have to, you'd have to unpack that because it happened on their watch. And it was a part of a whole sequence of events that they were involved with that targeted the Patriot community at yeah. that time. They so were move, very clear on that. So moving forward a little bit here, uh, the current events since the beginning of the year, or let's just say, let's take from December, we had this really strange executive order that came out from Trump. Uh, I don't remember the title of it, but it basically had to do with uh, forfeiture of funds due to criminal activity. The language in it looked like it was pointed directly at the Clinton Foundation. Um, then these are things that we can put in the public record to show. You talked earlier off air about um, these flight logs to Gitmo and the traffic that's going on there. It's very obvious that there is activity going on that indicates some sort of roundup may be in place. So let's work from those edges to try and come to some kind of picture. Right. So from an ask, we can bring this into the uh, astrological yeah. Yeah. context. Um, that executive order uh, was um, issued on December 21st, 2017. Yep. It was part of, part of a one-two punch. And of course, the, the, the jab was the executive order blocking the property of persons involved in serious human rights abuse or corruption. That's the big headline for that executive order. And then the right cross was the tax bill that was delivered the next day. And uh, that's, that was quite a serious combo that was delivered by Trump and the administration. And I think there are parts of both of those that came from different portions of the administration. The tax bill clearly was inundated by your typical Republican, conservative, corporatist, rightists. They were all on board with it. That, you know, smelled really good. But there's interesting things inside the tax bill and some not so very interesting things. Uh, but, he, but that was like, okay, we're going to give you this. Okay, well, you give us this. And then the executive order is this whole other kind of apparatus that is, is part of this combination. Now, if you look at the time that that executive order was signed, it was at 12.01, uh, it was just after midnight, it went into effect on December 21st. And that is the winter solstice. Right. So it's a very, very powerful time of year. It's the, it, it is sort of the, the death of the season, uh, of one season and, and the beginning of, a, of another season, right? We're entering into a literally a phase of darkness, although the light begins to come back slowly but surely, but it is really... We're, we're in the dark phase. Now, the language, the language on this, the bill itself is called Executive Order Blocking the Property of Persons Involved in Serious Human Rights Abuse or Corruption. That's right. And it enumerates itself under some very specific acts, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, the National Emergencies Act, and the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act. So we, we pulled this into the, the global stratosphere as well. And then um, it goes into a very long enumeration of what you would consider to be offenses. And again, these look highly targeted towards specific parties. The question then becomes, and I, and I pose this rhetorically as a way to say, be careful what you attribute as virtue when it comes to Donald Trump, largely because of the things we've talked about in terms of his own personality, his own inclinations, that they're, we know that Trump carries out vendetta. So the fact that this is being done may be wonderful on the, on the surface, but it also may, may be an angle to take out political operatives inside of his own administration. Uh, I, I think that there's a, 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 I think there's a large degree of truth in there. Um, Absolutely. I think if you want to look at the model for this, you want to look at what happened in Saudi Arabia. 
mm-hmm. when basically they had the purge of the princes yeah. and and shook, I mean it was it was clearly straight out of kind of you know a a um, a, a good or a godfather it really was style <laughs> style takedown and hit and there's no coincidence by the way that this happened after Trump and Jared Kushner had gone to Saudi Arabia yeah and, and done that uh, weird little ritual thing too by the way that that, that was very bizarre that whole yeah. thing well apparently Kushner and Crown Prince Salman are good friends of course they are because Israel and Saudi Arabia are let's just say they rub shoulders rather closely well the i mean i mean there there is plenty of evidence to to attribute that the house of saud actually started in israel at one point in time yeah and then and then moved down into what's now known as saudi arabia and carved out their their fiefdom so there's probably very little genetic variance between semitic israelis and saudis Right, exactly. Yeah. The other Uh, interesting, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to say, the other thing with Crown Prince Salman and Jared Kushner is that they're both millennials, which is is very interesting. And we have millennials really beginning to shape, uh, to some degree, global policy and this kind of internecine style of, you know, taking people out and reordering the Mandarin court to some degree, right? This, right. So, so I think what, what this is laying down the tracks for is something similar to what happened in Saudi Arabia. So yeah, I mean, Trump could take people out and it may be somebody like a John McCain or a Hillary Clinton, in which case people will, you know, shake their fists yeah. and cheer uh, and the pressure valve gets released for a little while. Um, and it may be used for some other more, egotistical or selfish means. I mean, what if there's a real beef between Donald Trump and Steve Bannon? Steve Bannon, maybe, yeah. Maybe, maybe, and I'm not saying that this would happen. I'm just giving an example. But I think, Randy, you're, you're clearly um, on to something here with this. And this is a big tool. And it happened during the equinox when the sun and Saturn were in conjunction <laughs> at that time yes. at zero degrees. Yes. I mean, this sun-Saturn conjunction on the equinox, I searched a very long time through the ephemeris, and I couldn't find uh, a, a winter solstice where the sun and Saturn were conjuncting Capricorn. I couldn't find it. Huh. If it happened, it happened a very long time ago. So we're looking at an event that is epic, epic wow. from an astrological standpoint. <laughs> and so what we have is we have, I mean, you know, we can get into kind of the arcane or the esoteric version of Saturn at one point in time, there was this 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 idea that Saturn was actually the sun, right, of, of gonna, our solar. I was going to say that, yeah. Right. Yeah. So now we have the former sun with the current sun conjoined together at the darkest night of the year. It's a very interesting assemblage of energy and metaphor, and I can only see this moving forward as the and we saw this again or previously with Pluto and Capricorn, which was really kind of unlike anything we had seen before. When Pluto went into Capricorn, the country went into default, and then there is this weird merger of the government and businesses, right? And we saw the rise of the corporatic state. It was right there under Pluto and Capricorn. The United States owned GM for a while. You know, yeah, and then yeah. they were branching off into- Chrysler. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah dog businesses like Solyndra and stuff like that. I mean, it was, you know, and the government had actually um, encouraged businesses and markets in the past, but rarely did say we're going to become partners here, right? That didn't, that didn't occur. Well, it did when Pluto went into Capricorn and there were other like various um, permutations of that. For instance, the, the people that owned the, the land uh, at Ground Zero, where they had Occupy Wall Street, right. that square that yeah. was owned by a group. The Cotty Park, the Cotty Park. The Cotty Park. It was owned by a group that had ties to Obama. Of course. So I mean, that was so that was an undercurrent of what, what happened with Pluto and Capricorn, and it became it started off with this eruption. It was like, oh my God, you know, the United States and these businesses are are conjoining. They're coming. It's, so, it's so funny to me that. 
one of the things that annoyed, AIG, the United States bailed out AIG. Yeah, was was just, yeah. It, like it, it, one of the things that has annoyed, and again, you know, I'm outside of the political spectrum. I want the whole thing to go away. I, I, I mean, you know, I would like to, I would like to live at some point in my life without this overarching, disgusting thing called government. Um, but the uh, people since, you know, Donald Trump has become president talking about how, you know, fascism is rising and we're becoming a fascist country and uh, we have Nazis and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, eh, well, I mean, in my opinion, we've actually been living under fascism for at least the last century, possibly longer. But to what you're saying, if people want to point to a moment where fascism was rising, it was right there. When you, with the merger, to, my, I well, always- that is, that is the definition of fascism. Right, that was the, oh, what I always understood the definition of fascism was, was the merging, merger of government and corp corporation. That's right, that's and right. That, now that people, the of fascism. Now, and now people terrible. say that fascism is oppressing well, minorities. You're, 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 like, yeah, you're earmarking a date somewhere around <laughs> 1871, yeah. the 14th Amendment, and what, what basically was the recontouring of the Constitution into a new Constitution without advice and consent. Basically, they took the Constitution of the United States, reformed it as the Constitution for the United States with the rejoined, with, with the yeah. joining of the 14th Amendment, which was a horrific piece of, of, of legislation, uh, the worst, single worst constitutional amendment we ever had. That was the point where America stepped over the line into basically being a fascist state. Fascist country, yeah. You know, I mean, they, so it's been going on for over a century. But if you want to talk about a time when it actually was rising, like Im immediately, what, the period of time you're talking about after 2009, 2009, 2009, 2009 yeah. that's yeah. when it happened. It, 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 I, there's been, you know, you can, from if you're pers depending on your perspective, you can say there's been um, a rise in racial extremism or whatever since Donald Trump has become become no, president. No, I don't believe that. No, I, no, well, I'm not. But I don't. I don't believe that either. But the yeah. like, okay. But even if you think that's true, which I don't, that's it's a different rise thing. Than the fascism. fascism of that. Right. The, the, yes. the, what I'm, my point is is that that's a different thing than fascism, and people are equating fa those two things. They're basically you know calling one the other and whatnot. What fascism is, is what we're just talked about here with Robert. Yeah, that's the classic Robert definition of a Mussolini-esque yeah. Yep, corporatism, fascism, absolutely, yeah. No, yeah, it, I, yeah, no I, I, I agree with you though, Robert, so yeah. Well, so now we have Saturn and Capricorn and Sun and Capricorn conjoined and creating a new, basically a new tax code and also creating this document, which is this executive order. And, I, you know, I believe you know, Trump came in and he basically kind of had this Reagan-esque moment when he gave his inaugural speech, yep. which was try kind of a, in a lot of ways, kind of a tremendous speech. If you take it at face value, I mean, that's a remarkable speech. And he basically says, we're going to give the government back to you. This is your government, okay? Your government. Now, these two pieces the executive order and the tax bill don't really in some ways reflect that because there is extreme power that's being granted. And Alex Jones has made a case and others have as well, that this executive order places us under a level of martial law, that it's already there. If you read it out and interpret it, the, the country has been placed under some light level of martial law. Now, that remains to be seen, but it's somewhere in this document. And Randy, you could probably scan through pretty quickly, maybe not now, but you'll, you'll, you'll find it. And he's not the only one. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, the researcher, the guy's actually pretty, Jerome Corsi. Yes. It, yeah. it actually came to the same, and Corsi's a smart guy. He's been around this stuff for a long time. And he came to the, he came to the same conclusion. So if that's the case, and this is what, you're bringing it back to QAnon, which is interesting because Alex Jones was not in the QAnon for a long time. He, right? But then it got popular, so he had to get in. He had to it. jump on the bandwagon, yeah. and, and he acknowledged it. And he would always say, "Well, um, our sources, My sources are, are, are better. Good. <laughs> this is what our sources have been telling us for a long time now, right?" Right, but wouldn't that be interesting? I mean, Alex Jones has been hoping and waiting, and and and, and on instead of you know waiting and for martial law for so long, wouldn't he? You know, that's kind of what he's built his whole career on—is that martial law was coming, right? 
And so it would be very interesting if the martial law came under the president that he so, so you know, put himself so, so behind. That's that would really be d deeply ironic. I mean, I think I love it. <laughs> he's having to contort himself quite a bit. Totally. Lately. lately. Totally. I he's saw like, he's I like saw a, a contortionist from Cirque du Soleil. He's got like his legs over his head. And <laughs> he, was, he was going on and on and on about what a great tax plan this was right. that Trump had put forth. And one of the things that he was uh, trumpeting in the tax plan was the fact that he had lost his ten thousand dollar credit for his property from the from the feds and he's like oh this is great because it's going to force the states now to drop property taxes and he was selling this every <laughs> single show so if you oh, it's great we have to look forward to this so then he had gerald salenti on his show and he brought it to salenti's attention and salenti is like are you kidding <laughs> These people are politicians. They're not going to give anything back. They're the white shoe boys. They're not, they're not going to give us a tax break. <laughs> so then Alex had to do a complete, like, you know, 180 on this thing. Yeah. And then, and, and then this is why we love to have you on the show, you know. And it was so, fun, <laughs> so funny to watch that. And then he did this thing the other day. I don't know if you caught it. But he was, he was uh, talking about, oh, sometimes I, I, I just really have to, you know, tell people that I was, I was wrong about something, you know, like, like, wow, he's going to have kind of a, a moment of humility, right? Where he's, he's going to say that he was wrong. Well, it turns out he's going to say he was wrong about Steve Bannon. <laughs> 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 right. So now he can get, you know, it's like, oh, I was wrong about him and I'm sorry. I brought him to your attention and da, 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 da. but it's just a way from the, it, it, you know, it's a, He's very clever psychologically. It's a, it's a way to once again reinforce Trump, and yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely, everything. I mean, it, not, it's it's embarrassing the way he has slutted himself out for Trump. It, it's embarrassing. It's totally embarrassing. Yeah, it's really. And crazy. then and then his and then you get these uh, red alerts about his sources. You know, his sources Back. were. Back. I mean, I mean, <laughs> man, he was banging on these Yemeni terrorists that were going to start a terror wave all across the United States. It never happened. Well, yeah, don't you remember all the terrorists that were supposedly coming over the southern border that were going to be doing oh, yeah. coordinated bombings in cities and things? That's yeah. an old, that's, this, this Yemeni thing was just recently. Like, uh, yeah, I don't follow Because right now he's trying to sell a war in Iran. You know, he's, he's working with Stratfor and, you know, the Black yep. Cube guys, where, you know, wherever yep. he's getting a so lot of his money. He definitely works for Stratford. There's like, Absolutely. So yeah. now he's now he's here to sell the war with Iran. Absolutely. Just as a just as a kind yeah. of addition uh, to get off this executive order, it's important to note that the order itself mentions an annex that is on the end of the document, which is a list of thirteen names. And I don't know yep. if anybody's gone through the, the thirteen names yet, and and began to do the forensics on this. Those 13 names are actually a way of nesting an entire series of accomplices through international money laundering and terrorist activities. Uh, so in one sense, this order is very specific. And, and they have ties to the Clinton Foundation. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I said. This was all contoured to the Clinton yep. Foundation, beginning yep. with Dan Gertler, who you can look up. That's right. He's an Israeli billionaire businessman. So, you know, it is highly targeted. It's pretty phenomenal. We've not seen this with executive orders. They're generally broad strokes. The language in this is very explicit in some ways. Very explicit and even targeting individuals. Well, yeah. What we see in executive order, the targeted individuals. Yeah. I got uh, something burning here that I want to bring up and I don't want to preempt you, Emily, because I know you've got some things. We're now looking at something very interesting. And I don't know if anybody's picked this up. What is going on in Iran in terms of uh, the protests that are occurring there? Are we beginning to see the reversal of the 1979 Iranian revolution? Are we seeing a movement away from Islamic extremism? 1979 is a benchmark year. That's really where we begin to see the high water mark of what was this insurgency that led up to the drumbeats of 9-11 in terms yeah, well, of- that, that period of time in like late 70s, yeah. 
79 was where yeah, that, I mean, up until that point, well, that was when the big new Brzezinski started all the stuff with the creating of the Mujahideen and all of that kind of stuff, you know, during the Carter administration. During the Carter right? administration, yeah. right. So you, we're, we're, we're now going back in history, oh gosh, 40 years, almost 50 years. Yeah. And well, yeah. yeah, it's not lost on me that this is blowback now that what we saw as the inception of the Islamic threat in 1979 is starting to come full circle, almost in the birthplace where it began. Well, I think the Islamic threat was placed there. Of course it was. Uh, yeah. And so, first of all, the Shah of Iran was getting too big for his britches. He wanted to nationalize petroleum. That's what he wanted to do. He saw himself, and really, I mean, I know people who um, were living in Iran during that time, and uh, they, to a person, it was almost like a golden age. I mean, the Shah was really into the arts. Uh, he was, you know, pro, pro woman. It was very westernized yeah. um, and a very, very wealthy culture. Now, if you were a dissident and you didn't like what was going on, you know, he had the Savak and he turned them loose and he'd get real ugly. But he, you know, just like Mosaddegh before him, whom he was put in place of, Mosaddegh was a really smart guy. He was a very, very, he was tuned into everything. And the Shah was not that smart. The Shah was quite vain. But, but the Shah, through his vanity, began to believe that he had a monarchy and was, and was really a power. And that by nationalizing the petroleum, that he could literally become kind of this, you know, reincarnation of Darius or one of these, Mm. Um, you know, really powerful Iranian Persian figures, right? I mean, so um, the CIA and, and the oil companies had another thing coming. You know, they were like, are you kidding me? You're not going to nationalize that oil. That's our oil. And we put you there and we put you in place. So you could basically be a puppet. Yeah. And now you're taking your role a bit too seriously. So he needed to be removed. That's number one, first and foremost. Second of all, Jimmy Carter, when he went into the, the office, he kind of did a, a quasi-Kennedy, quasi-Trump, and he caught a lot of CIA people loose when he got into office, and they were pissed. Okay. And, they, and they wanted payback. And part of their payback was staging this coup in conjunction with the, the Seven Sisters and the oil companies in Iran, and the Ayatollah was a minor figure. He was a total minor figure at that time. And, and, and they brought him in off the, from the, out of Paris, off the sidelines, to become this religious figurehead. And there was a deal that was struck during that time. Mm -hmm. and, and the deal basically was, look, you, you don't have any aspirations of, of doing anything more. You're gonna, you're gonna have basically a, a religious kingdom. You don't have any aspiration of being a world power. You can just stay here. And your and your uh, descendants, your 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 religious descendants, can continue to rule. And so that's how it's been in Iran for quite a while. And 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 I, but I think something something fundamentally changed when Obama made that deal. When he made the deal with the Iranians and the nuclear deal and the money deal, that's that's what got the Israelis really pissed off. And the Israelis, of course, have this, what is it, the Hinnon plan, which is turning the entire area into greater Israel. I mean, they, they want to turn Iran upside down and inside out. Absolutely. In Syria and every, yeah, yeah. Every, yeah. Right. And so, you know, what I think we saw was a concerted effort between factions that the U.S. were putting in place and factions that the Israeli had put in place to foment something inside of Iran. And I think that was kind of a, you know, reverse color revolution or something like that. And it just didn't work. It didn't work because it didn't have the, the real traction of the people. I, I think the people sniffed it out. And even though, even though the people may not necessarily like Rouhani, Rouhani and the clerical, um, you know, sort of prelate government in Iran, I think for them, it would be even worse to have this outside intervention mm -hmm. 
take place. Yeah, and, yeah. and Iranian so people are not stupid. They're not. No, stupid. they're not. I mean, it's they're, br brilliant. they're brilliant people. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, very high so it, art, high mathematical, high science kind of culture. Absolutely. And yeah. poetic. I mean, some of the yep. nicest people, most yep. enlightened people I've met on this planet are Persians. They're I agree. Incredible people. I agree. And, and so what are you going to do? Are you going to side on, you know, Israel, the United States, who are going to foment this revolution and knowing that it's bullshit? I actually have a friend who's, she's, um, she was born in Iran and um, she's uh, very, kind of like us. She's into a lot of the same things that we're into. She's very smart. But she told me that, um, you know, it's basically the people, the, she thinks that the, like the, the, the tyranny here in the United States and place the Western countries in some ways is worse than in Iran because in Iran, they, they know they're not free. And here the people think they are. You know what I mean? And, and I, yeah, I, you know, and so I, I, you know, she, she grew up in that. She was there in the top period of time where it went from being a fairly free, you know, country like you were talking about to it became, uh, you know, they want people, women to put the job on and all that kind of stuff. So she's been through that tyranny, but she said she, they understood what it was. Whereas here people, because they can play with their iPhones and do a bunch of dumb shit, think they're free when we're really li living under, in a lot of ways, very similar tyrannies. Oh, absolutely. I think absolutely. the cautionary tale too here is that we're looking in hindsight, and I looked at the Iranian revolution, the, the, the rise, uprising in the Ayatollah Khomeini was around 77, so we are 40 years out on this. But here's the thing, the peacock throne is gone from Iran. It's not coming back, and this is the byproduct of nation state building that the U.S. has been involved with since 1947, is there is nothing in place in Iran to replace the theocracy that is now installed. There's right. no system, there's no succession to leadership. The vacuum itself would be chaotic. So yeah. the people themselves are simply attempting to push back on the extreme aspects of, his, of Islam and theoretically keep the order of their nation while they work through what it is they have to do to reconfigure. And we need to look at that as well here because tearing down a system creates a vacuum into which yeah. even more chaos can flow. Well, I think you're right. And you, you know, there are people who would love to see the left just get completely obliterated. And while I think the left needs to really rethink their strategy, their platform and their ideology, um, I don't think it's a, it's a really good thing for the left I to agree. get obliterated. No, because I, now all of a sudden, you know, we have this mono system. Yeah, no good. And, and, and while I, I, I do believe that there needs to be some cohesion, I mean, I think it'd be great if we could be cohesive. Or really, it would be wonderful if we could come together, but come together in a way where you know, certain needs from both sides of these various templates or the temporal lobes could be met. But, but yeah, you know, I, I, looked at, I looked at what's been going on since the 1960s. And I looked at what's been going on since 9-11, you know, 2001. What's happened is that in the 1960s, a revolution was put into place. Yeah, I heard you talking about that. Yeah. To yeah. Totally put into place. And that has not abated, by the way. It has not abated. I mean, we talk about revolution and Obama and change and, you know. Students they're, they're, for a democratic socialism, right? That one. Uh, the, students for democratic society. Yeah. yeah. Now yeah. we have Antifa. Well, SDS and the program yeah. of SDS be basically became the template for a lot of education yep. across, you know, universities across the country. So the left yeah. won. Bill Layers and the left won. Yeah. And, and, and Obama was the, the crowning achievement of that victory. And Bill Layers going to the White House, you know, 250 days out of 300, 300 and, um, you know, 65 days out of the year, right? I mean, that's, that, was, that was Bill Layers during the Obama administration. So they, they actually won, but we've, we've still been in that revolutionary cycle, revolutionary pattern. You can see it in commercials. You can see it, them targeting millennials. You know, you can see it on the left still. With I liked your analysis. Well, it's a good example of exactly what happens. The culture has moved so much in our lifetimes. If you take and just earmark a period, say post-1965, and you move it forward, the culture itself is so radically changed at this point, everything yeah. about it. Yeah. You're not going back. We're not going back to white bread conservative America. Well, here's the other piece. Now you, you added 9-11-2001. 
and, and you have the terror threat yeah. and the war without end. And on the one hand, you have this movement and wave that was set up right around that time. It's really after the death of Kennedy. And right around that time, you have this movement and wave that's set up, which is radical, it's revolutionary, it's change. And what is the ultimate goal of the change, which is never really talked about, yeah. by the way. Never right? talked about. There are, these, there are these, these ideals, but those ideals, they're always changing too. Yeah. Right. So well, there's also, it, during that period of time, though, from then to now, the left has gone from being anti-war to being very pro-war, which is very weird. Right, because ideology but that, shifted. Right? Ideology shifted. There's ideas, and you know what I mean. There, but there isn't. I don't know if the left is pro-war in as much as I think that they are. Um, Impotent. Oh, of course they're pro-war. They've been pro-war since Harry Truman. They were no, pro-war with the left. I'm not talking about the left in government. I'm talking about the like if you were to talk the to idealistic the left. Yeah, idealistic like like a left-leaning intellectual that you right. would have a conversation with in Starbucks. Right. You would ask them, "Are you pro-war?" And I would, <laughs> so I, they, they and would, I would bet they would say no. They would. They wouldn't but say. They would, that. But they have no response. They would. They wouldn't say they're pro-war, but they would say that. But they would. You know. They would they would reel off some of the MSNBC talking points about why Assad has to go and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like they, so there is a confusion. I would agree with happening. that. I, I would, to, I would yeah. totally agree with that. Yeah. But the idea of war to them would be reprehensible. But they don't like the idea of it, but they, they've yeah. been so brainwashed by some of this stuff that they've well, become agree. sympathetic to some of these ideas. I would agree. But getting back to this piece with, because after 9-11, 2001, what do we want? We want security. We want safety. And, we're, and, and the war and terror is only going to end, by the way, when they say it ends. Right. Which is now. Which is uh, until there's a new world order, right? right. Until, the aliens come. until the aliens come. So, so we, okay, so we're living, we're living between these two poles of constant revolution and change and the wave that started in the 60s and the endless war, the war without end, the war and terror, one wants radicalism and freedom and all these things that theoretical is along with it. And the other wants security, safety, and everything else. So these are the poles that we're clashing yeah. into yeah. in our culture constantly. And no wonder we're so screwed up, you know, on some level, because these are the forces that are in some ways controlling our collective signal. Yeah, we're collectively bipolar. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe, that, it, maybe that's why they're spraying lithium from the plane. <laughs> and, and, and if you really want to boil this down to the, to, the, to the parties that represent both of these factions, on the one hand, you have the social Marxists and the neoliberals, and on the other hand, you have the xiofascists and the right, neocons. And, the neocons. Yep. and these are the forces that are driving both of those cultural yep. paradigms. Yeah. Yep. So that first hour went really fast. That was... Uh, well, the first, hour, the first hour isn't really over because we haven't done the readings yet. <laughs> the readings are part okay. of the first so hour. We're, we're, so we're, we're having we're, a long first hour. But okay. That was great. I'm glad we, I'm glad there we you asked. go, folks. You get the bonus right up front. <laughs> we didn't even talk about astrology. Oh, my God. That's I know. Great. We didn't, so, but this was a great conversation. It was a good we're, conversation. Let's, so let's, do, let's move into our readings, and then after the readings, we'll take a break, and we'll come back with the members' hour. Um, just quickly so people know. Um, so when we had the last um, uh, – patron participant show uh, with Chris Kaler. I opened it up to all the patrons. This time, some of these patrons are coming from our upper levels. Um, and on the next participation show, I will open it to everyone again. So we're kind of playing around with different ways of doing that. So we're gonna get into these readings now. And um, first up is Janine. Janine, welcome to Off Planet Radio. Here with Robert Phoenix. Hi, Robert. Hi, Janine. So you're part of the elite version of Fancy. Off Planet Radio. That gets out. <laughs> Off Planet Radio has elites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Janine, um, you're going to be fine. Who's next? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> all right. Listen, so, Janine, are you familiar with astrology at all? Do you know your chart? Yes. Okay. I've been looking into it a lot in the last six months. So. All right. So, of course, you've got uh, the uh, little uh, power, power duo of Neptune and the True Node and Sag uh, in the first, and then Sun Venus conjunction in Scorpio in the first. It's a pretty, it's a pretty powerful first house in a lot of ways. There's a lot going on there. A lot of Scorpio uh, going on. A lot of Scorpio and, and yeah. the smidgen, smidgen of Sag, which is you know leaking yeah. into your 
second house. So um, you're aware that Jupiter is transiting your first house currently, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first house is the self and you have a lot invested in that part of your chart, your identity. So you're theoretically a, a double Scorpio, sun and Scorpio, Scorpio rising, Venus is there, your, your connection to relationships and um, in a very intense kind of way, by the way, because that's the language of Scorpio. Yeah. Uh, Jupiter is going to be in your first house from roughly now until what are we talking about? Uh, February, see, it's, it's, it's uh, October, November of next year, another six uh, this year, another six months. So, right around February, March of 2019, Jupiter is going to be in your first house. Okay. And traditionally, Jupiter in the first house represents a sense of you know, goodwill, expansion of your identity, you know, taking more risks. Jupiter's related to you, gambling, Sagittarius, even though it's in Scorpio here, taking more risks with yourself on a personal level. But I have, a, I have a, a, another piece here that you may wanna take into consideration because you're about to go through some significant change in your life. And with yeah. Jupiter in your first house, what I would do is I would, I would take the next six to eight months, maybe up until really about uh, November, you know, so they, they were talking next a lot, and I would fill up. I would fill up. I would fill up. What does that mean to fill up? Well, I would do things that would number one recharge you. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, add to sort of the, the 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 juice of who you are, and that could be really mundane stuff like eating really well, sleeping really well, having really good sex. I mean, you got Jupiter in Scorpio in the first house conjuncting your Sun. It's regeneration. Scorpio is a sexual sign. It's regeneration through sexuality. But I'm not just talking any kind of sex. I'm talking really powerful, regenerative contact with somebody you're connected to and love. If that's not going to take place, you don't have that in your life, then get into some form of yoga that's tantric yeah. and really draw this energy in. This is a year for you to both expand, which is the nature of Jupiter, but also take in because Scorpio is such a receptive sign. So this is a powerful time for you charge up money wise. It could be a very good year for you. You could receive, you know, benefits that are out of the blue. Other people's assets, bank that. You want to bank things for the next year. You don't want to be, uh, you don't want to be, uh, with, yeah. with, you know, uh, austere, yeah. right? But this is a time for you to recharge and bring whatever it is you can to get stronger, juicier, more full, right? You want to be, the word is effulgent. Yeah, okay. I, I've actually hit like a spot financially where it's like I'm going uphill instead of downhill. Like I'm seeing my habits change financially. So oh, good. I good, have good. a feeling like that's already kicking in a little bit. You know, the great thing about Scorpio, especially Jupiter in your first house, Scorpio is one of these signs that can be both um, repellent and attractive simultaneously. And you've yeah, got, uh, you've got Mars there. Right? <laughs> you've got Mars right yeah. on your ascendant. That's intense. Yeah. Yeah. A very intense placement for Mars, you know. Yeah. It's a very powerful. I'm a, I'm a whole lot of woman. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that can really attract certain people. Yeah. And that can also push certain people away. Mm -hmm. So when we talk Jupiter, though, we have the potential of powerful attraction and magnetism. What do you want to attract into your life? I mean, that's really a rhetorical right. question. Because Jupiter and Scorpio will help you bring that into your life. So if you want more wellness, you want more money, you, and this is not magical thinking, okay? No. This, this is biocircuitry connected to Scorpio, mm -hmm. which is magnetic. And you can feel it in your body. Mm -hmm. Like if you want more resources in your life, feel it in your body. Feel it from the base of your spine all the way through your, your abdomen, up through your midsection, let it fill your body. And not in a way that is you know, self-serving, but look, resources right. can help you and they can help other people. Yeah. If that's what you want, bring it in. You know, if you, if you want a really, really good lover so that you can express your femininity, that Sun-Venus conjunction, you can bring that in too. This is the nature of Scorpio. It can be really attractive. So for the next year, you get to practice that attraction. Now, the reason why you want to bring it in, the reason why you want to recharge, the reason why you want to have more of these resources is because you are going to go through the Saturn opposition, okay? 
That's yeah. going to take place in at the end of 2019. And the Saturn opposition is a pole shift. And Saturn right now is in your second house. And you've got Saturn up in the ninth house. Do you do any teaching or anything? Do you have any? Like, Not a, currently, no. I used to teach um, yeah. horseback riding, but. I mean. Yep. That's, geez, that, that's such a great Saturn ninth house cancer mm -hmm. kind of deal. What, what caused you to move away from that? 2008 financial crisis. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. And then I moved, yeah. I mean, what have you been doing since 2008? Um, I, I moved back to where I grew up and have been, I've still been in the horse industry, but I'm more, um, I'm in a foaling position, like medical stuff, vet tech kind of thing. So, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so, you know, the Saturn opposition represents a fundamental change in what you do. And that doesn't mean yeah. that you won't be dealing with horses anymore. I mean, you've got that nice right. moon and Sag and true note and Sag, all very equine, right? Um, but you, there's a, there's a big change coming. There's yeah. a, and that's what happens when you, when you get to 44, uh, there's a script that's flipped and yeah. primarily, and I, and I talk to people, um, about this and, uh, you know, people uh, back in the old days, right. When, when there was more of kind of a classic kind of dynamic between men and women, men went to work and women stayed at home. Mm -hmm. Um, the men would really go through this Saturn flip in their lives, they, right around 44, right. 45, they go through the Saturn flip, they'd be at their peak in terms of their earning potential, and they say, this isn't enough. I right. need to do something different, more meaningful, whatever. And so a lot of times men would, you know, they, they'd leave their jobs, they start their own businesses, maybe sometimes they'd have a midlife crisis. This yeah. is what would happen. For women right around that time, it, it was usually sort of synchronous with children leaving home around yeah. 23, 24, and they'd been, for the most part, mostly housewives. This is, this is like, you know, this is the MAGA version of America, right? Uh, and then they'd, then they'd leave the house and they'd maybe go back into the workforce. That would be mm -hmm. part of the Saturn flip. But all that's, all that's changed now and it's become much more personal and less kind of driven by uh, culture and gender in some ways. So for you, you're dealing with Saturn in the second house, which is about making money, right? You've, you've had Saturn in your second house for a while. Yeah. And it's in Capricorn, and you got to work a little bit harder with Saturn and Capricorn, but it's worth it. You know, this uphill thing versus yeah. downhill is part of that Saturn transit we're going through uh, the, uh, the second house. But so I see the flip is going back up to the ninth house, which is more ideological, more teaching, big yeah. ideas, big ideas. And cancer representing things that are nurturing, bonding. Yep. You know, so this is, I think, where you're headed. So what you want to do, getting back to your first house, you want to bring your resources in. You want to recharge. You want that fullness. So when that, that flip comes into play, um, mm. you're going to be in a position where you might be able to do something. Right. Versus saying, God, I wish I had an extra $3,500 or $5,000 right. or $10,000, which could preclude you for that right? Yeah. So the other thing too, is you're going to go through a Uranus opposition at the, right around the same time. This is very unusual. Yeah. You have a Saturn opposition, <laughs> Uranus opposition, and both of them mark significant change. And where is Uranus? It's in your, it's in your sixth house, which is your, your work, your purpose, your Dharma. Yeah. And you've got Uranus uh, natally over there at uh, 29 Libra in your 12th house. So yeah. there are deep changes taking place yeah. with, with Uranus in your 12th. And even Uranus in, in the sixth, which is to me a, a fundamental uh, and radical shift in what you do. And when it goes into Taurus, right, that's different than being in the sign of Aries. Uh, Aries is, is, is it's, you know, very directed in some ways. Uh, and, and, and Taurus is directed too, but you're dealing more with kind of the earth. And you're dealing more with elements and you're dealing more with nature. So, you know, I see you kind of you know getting back into nature getting back into something that is not that you're not going to make money don't get me wrong but it's going to be a different way for you right to, to 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 bring whatever it is you need into your life and going up into that ninth house i, I mean i would almost um see this as being like you know get having to having a position at a college or a university that might be part-time that has horses or something yeah. sort of agra connected to it 
you know, and it, may, and it may not be something that pays off immediately, but it gets you right. into a new place. Building something, yeah. Yeah, it's like, wow, this is really cool, you know. I yeah. Maybe I've got, you know, two units here or something like that or 20 hours a week, but there's, but there's the potential for more. And that's Saturn. Saturn's the highest planet in your chart, which to me indicates that you come into that Saturnian realm, you know, later in life. And in the ninth house, mm -hmm. that represents a teacher. So I feel like that's kind of where your 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 big change is gonna, gonna come from. So save up, you know, bring in this juice in your life so you can have some resources where you can take a risk and make a change. Awesome. I'll keep an eye open. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. That was Thank awesome. Thank you. All right. So next up is Sandra. Sandra, welcome to Off Planet Radio, and you are with Robert B. Hi, Robert. Uh, hi, hi, Sandra. Let's see. Okay, I've got to find your chart. Hold on one sec. Yes, there you are. Okay. So, um, how are you tonight? I'm good. Thank you. I'm fine. Great. Um, okay. So um, uh, you are not a Scorpio rising. Almost. Uh, we have Sagittarius rising. We have a lot of Sagittarius Scorpio in the uh, in the house tonight, uh, and your chart is quite interesting. How much do you know about your chart? Not really, not a lot. <laughs> not a lot. Okay, so let me just give you a quick little breakdown of your chart. You have what's called a splay chart, and it's where you have almost like a a triangle. Think of um, kind of a like a yoga pose where you have your hands above your head, and then you have your your feet. Uh, legs splayed out this way. It makes it almost like a triangle. And that's, uh, that is the, the, uh, the geometry of your chart. And when we have splay charts, uh, I would say 90% of the time, we have what's called a grand shrine inside the chart. And true to the chart, true to the splay chart, you have one. The grand shrine is when we have three, three, uh, three separate signs that are combining together by degree. In this case, um, you have, let's see, ba -ba 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 -ba. You, you basically have, you have two grand shrines, which is unusual. You know, if you get one, you're doing really, really well. You got two. So uh, what they are is when these three planets are connected vis-a-vis -vis the same element. So for instance, um, you have Uranus in the sign of Libra, air sign, nine degrees. You have your true node and Mars in Aquarius, air sign. And then you have your sun at 20 degrees, Gemini, air sign. There's your grand trine, but you also have a grand trine in Earth with your moon in Capricorn at 24, your Pluto in Virgo at 26, and your uh, Saturn and Venus conjunct in Taurus. Wow, 29 degrees. So it's pretty, pretty rare, pretty unusual chart. And you'll also see in your chart that it also forms a kite pattern as well. So you have two grand trines, and you have a kite pattern. You hit the jackpot astrologically in this lifetime. Congratulations. Um, now, that said, uh, you have a, a part of your chart that is quite interesting, and that's the rising sign, Sagittarius, with Neptune on the ascendant. And back in the old days, in astrology, if people, like if we were, if I was a, an astrologer from, say, the 1915s or 10s or whatever, and I was reading the chart, and I saw Neptune on the ascendant, um, your, your, your lot in life would not be good, right? It would be considered a malefic with Neptune on the ascendant. Oh, the poor girl, she's going to be deluded and confused and wander through life without purpose and people will, will misunderstand her. Well, there's some truth in that, but not completely. Neptune on the Ascendant is, uh, a, a, it's an aspect where people will project onto you whatever it is that they have inside themselves that they want to see in you. And this, is, this is one of the difficulties of Neptune. So if you're in a good place and they're in a good place, boy, you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, oh my gosh, she's a goddess. She's a goddess. Let's bow to her. But if you're not, if you're not in a good place, and sometimes Neptune, it's a water sign, it's a water planet, and, it, and it's in like the tides. And if you're not in a good place and they're not in a good place, all of a sudden they, they, they want to lynch you from the highest tree because Neptune is very scapegoaty. And that's the nature of Neptune on the Ascendant. It, it's, it's, very, it's variable. It's quite variable and even more variable because you have Neptune in the sign of Sagittarius, which is, which is mutable. Now, nothing's really happening there for you at this time. Um, okay. You don't have anything on your ascendant. I'm just giving you kind of a breakdown in your charts. The one thing that you 
need to understand and know is that um, you have to, <laughs> you have to, one of your lessons in this lifetime is non attachment. When you have Neptune on your rising sign, if people think you're the goddess, I'll oh, thank you very much. You know, great, thank you. If people think you are, um, you know, you know uh, Attila the Hun, oh, thank you very much. There's, this is what happens with Neptune. We don't practice attachment with Neptune mm -hmm. because you can't, you can't allow this kind of tidal um, response with the outer world affect who you are. You also have Jupiter conjunct Neptune, and that brings a whole other kind of piece into, this, uh, into the discussion. You have the potential for tremendous faith tremendous faith in your life so my my two cents if there's anything that you can take away with from tonight's reading and i'll get into a few transits for you is that for you it pays to believe in miracles and magic okay remember that in your charts you can be somebody who's a placeholder for miracles and magic through the process of faith Always, always have, in, to the best of your ability, always have positive outcomes you, in your heart. If you have positive outcomes in your heart, and I know this sounds cliche and trite, but it's true. With this Neptune-Jupiter conjunction, the chances are that you're going to have a higher degree of really high-level interaction with the world around you. Okay? You hold that in yourself, in your chart, in your life. And you'll be able to watch things unfold in, very, in a very unique kind of way. Now, you're going to have Jupiter conjuncting your Neptune and conjuncting your Ascendant uh, next November. And then Jupiter is going to run into your first house, just like it's already there uh, in the last chart we did. But it's a bit different for you because when Jupiter goes into your first house in Sagittarius, it's, it's a little bit different than Scorpio. Scorpio is, you know, we got into what that meant in the last reading. In Sagittarius, it's about freedom. It's about freedom of expression. It's about expansion. It's about having goodwill and good faith in the world and towards other people. The, you know, starting next November, you can have a very positive, very positive experience in your life. Very liberating, extremely liberating. The only the other thing that I wanted to bring up with your chart, um, if, I, if I may, is uh, you're going to have uh, Pluto on your moon. Over in, in roughly two and a half years. That'll be a very, very powerful time for you on an emotional level. And if we had more time, I would get into that with you. But that's a major time for you. And Pluto moves quite slowly. So it's not one of these transits that will happen um, overnight. So why don't we stop there, if that was helpful or meaningful for you. And um, we can perhaps move on to the next reading. Thank you, Sandra. Okay, so next up, is Megan. Megan, welcome to Off Planet Radio. You are with Robert. Hello. Hi, Megan. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm swell. So I'll ask you the same question. How much do you know about your chart? A little bit. Like I know where some of my things like lie, but I don't really know. I, this is the first time I've ever had my birth chart read. Oh, cool. Okay. So let's just do a quick breakdown. Gemini rising. Uh, you have Sun and Leo, you have uh, Sun True Node Conjunction, which is quite interesting. Um, I'm a Gemini rising? Gemini rising, yep, that's what I have. One, you're born 110 a.m., correct? One, th that's the best my mom could give me, Like I, yep. and I lost my original birth certificate, so okay, so 110. I'm just, yeah, so I'm ripping off the time, August 15th, 1980. Oh, correct? no, a April 15th. Oh, April 15th, oh. So I know, so I know that I know I'm, um, um, sun, moon, mercury, Aries. Okay, great. Let me just. Apparently Capricorn rising. So. It was really funny. That's what I was like. I started to do your chart, um, before the show and I was, my eyes were really, really tired and I was uh, having a hard time, which is why when we got onto the show, I, I asked uh, the people to tell me their birth, um, information because my eyes are kind of shot tonight. Let me get in here and, and, um, and uh, edit your, your, so you're born April 15th. April 15th, yep. Okay, good, thank you. All right, so let me get in here and just move this along. There we go. All right, ah, Capricorn rising, there we go. 
Very, oh, I like this chart better. <laughs> so you're Capricorn rising and you have a sun moon, con, you have sun moon conjunction, which means you're born on a new moon, uh, which is great. And you were like born like almost right on the new moon, uh, roughly 30, was it 30 minutes? Uh, 26 to 51, so it's 25 minutes, 25 minutes um, separating the moon and the sun at that point in time. Uh, really interesting. Third house, which gives you a Gemini kind of perspective with the sun-moon conjunction in the third. Uh, Capricorn rising, and you also have a grand trine in your chart. It's a fire trine. Uh, you have a uh, sun uh, and moon at 26 degrees. Now, what's interesting, though, is because Jupiter is early Virgo, it's in trine with uh, sun and moon. And then you have the Mars uh, and true node conjunction in Leo also trine, sun and moon. And then you have Neptune in Sagittarius. Uh, you, let's see, 22, 26. You have a lot of, are you creative? Do you like to do creative stuff? I'm a musician. Yeah, so you have a really creative chart. Uh, you know, the Mars uh, Neptune trine is one of the, one of the uh, best for creativity. Of course, we know Leo is a very creative sign. And your true note is in the sign of, of Leo also augurs a great deal of creativity. Do you collaborate creatively with other people? Not yet. <laughs> I'm an electronic music musician, so. Oh, cool. All right. So. Excellent. Excellent. Um, you know, so that a lot of times it's very Yay. slow. Uh, I, would encourage <laughs> <laughs> I would encourage collaboration. Okay. Collaboration. And, that, and, and that, by the way, that doesn't mean that you have to collaborate with another person that plays an instrument, you can collaborate with somebody who does vocals and, uh, and they can sing with you while you lay down your tracks because your true note is in the seventh house, which is the house of relationship and partnership. So this is something, the true note is a really important part of the chart. It's like the true north of the chart. Okay. And you can um, kind of augur your life by the true note. And so when it's in the seventh house, that's the arrow that is pointing. The seventh house is relationship, partnering, bonding with the other and creatively bonding with the other. And not only do you have the true node in the seventh house, but guess what? Transiting true node is in Leo, also in the seventh house. So this is a great time for you to explore uh, the connection in partnership, whether it's creative or otherwise. It could be personal partnership, uh, certainly can be creative partnership. You have, a, you have a super creative chart. You've got Scorpio on the midheaven and you have Uranus in the 10th house, which indicates an unconventional career path and using things like technology and the internet and uh. mixed media, multimedia <laughs> to make your way through the world. And people have Scorpio in the midheaven want to change the world in some ways. It doesn't yes. mean, it doesn't, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't mean that you have to change the world through create an executive order, but you may change the world through creating a really powerful piece of music and change people's emotions as a result of that. Uh, you've got a really super interesting chart. You've got a Sun-Pluto opposition. In some ways, partnership could also be challenging for you too. Because you have Pluto and Libra, which is all about joining and partnering and connecting with another person, although Pluto's an outer planet, but your Sun is in that really personal sign of, of Aries, even though it's at the end of Aries. So you have this, to some degree, this conflict between Libra and Aries in your chart, being your own individual focused self and also bonding and connecting with other people who will transform your life. Um, have you ever um, connected with somebody from another country in terms of bonding, partnering, relating? Has that ever happened for you? Oh, oh yes, yeah, it has. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. we, we won't go there. <laughs> but that's also part of the Pluto sun opposition and the Pluto moon opposition. And it's not bad. I mean, you also have, a v you have Venus and Gemini in the fifth house, which is really fun and playful and creative, and it's in trine with your Pluto. So again, that could be really transformational collaboration. But getting together with another person at a distance seems to be something you have to reconcile um, in this lifetime. Uh, the big news for you is you've got Saturn going through your 12th house. Congratulations. It's one of the most uh, interesting, enduring, and in some ways powerful transits through astrology because the 12th house is the, the last house of the zodiac. Take Saturn all 30 years to go all the way around from the ascendant, go through all the signs, and come back to the first house. And Saturn going through the 12th house is for you uh, going to be roughly a, a two year process. And when Saturn goes through the 12th house, you're clearing out the last 
30 years of your life, but not in a personal way like Saturn on your moon and dealing with the last 30 years of your emotions and your home and dealing with your mother. It's the areas of your life that you have not necessarily reconciled. In the, and what happens with these events and these uh, emotions, these experiences, they, they got to go somewhere. They want to go over to the 12th house. And they hang out there until Saturn goes through. And guess what Saturn does? Go, okay, what have you not resolved? What have you not lived or lived through? You know, what was partially completed or halfway or whatever those things are. You get to go through it for two years. You get to clear it out. It's a very spiritual, quote, unquote, transit because the 12th house is also the house of the soul. And what you're doing is you're clearing out for new communication between you and your soul. You know, and, and it's like the dead wood. It's the things, the detritus, the scars, all that stuff. You get to clear it out. Sometimes it's painful. I'm Sometimes curious, like when yeah. did, when did the, this two years start? Because I've been consciously working on this. Uh, this would have really started. Um, I, I guess you could go back to the last time that Saturn was on Neptune, the Saturn Neptune conjunction which would have taken place. Let me, let me get the ephemeris. Hold on. I have it up here. Where did you go? Cause like it's you're, this is like, so on the T like, it's like, wow. <laughs> um, it, it would have started, let's see, back in 20, uh, 2016, to be honest with you, right around 2016, because that's when Saturn began to hit your, your natal Neptune. And of course it went retrograde. And then went back again. And so Saturn was on Neptune in September of last year, 2017. And, and Neptune is the gateway to your 12th house. So, but now you're in it. Now you're in it. And you're going to be out of it. You're into 2019. And that augurs a, a rebirth for you, a rebirth phase. Saturn's going to be on your ascendant. Pluto's already there. And when Saturn hits the ascendant in Capricorn, it's like, it's all business. It's all business, taking care of business. And you've cleared things out. You've cleared out the non-essentials. And you're ready to take your next step in a very mature kind of fashion. So enjoy the process. Maybe you can use it creatively and make some music out of it. It's what I do all the time. <laughs> the 12th house suite. There you go. Awesome. Thank you, Robert. And you're welcome. Cool. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Right. Bye. Okay. Bye. So last but certainly not least, Linda, you're up. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. You are with Robert Phoenix. Thank you. Hi, Robert. Hi, Linda. Are you all? Are you in Australia currently? I am in Australia. Yeah, in the southwest. Okay. Well, hello, all the way from across the planet. Hello. <laughs> How much do you know about your chart? I know I'm a Libra. That's about it. Yes, I have your birth date right. Uh, the first of October, 1976. Correct. That's it. Yes. And that's 9:10 p.m. Correct. Apparently so, yes. And born in a suburb of Melbourne, correct? In Melbourne, yes. There you go. <laughs> All right. So you are Taurus rising with a Libra sun, and you have Pluto conjunct your sun in Libra. Ooh. So you're not just any ordinary Libra. You are a Libra that is witchy. You're a witchy poo Libra. Because uh, <laughs> that's, you know, when, and Libras tend to be, you know, very very nice and you know very uh pleasant and uh they tend to be very polite in a lot of ways and so you have that but you also have some intensity that your run-of-the-mill or average libra does not have and you have uh your son pluto in the fifth house can i ask you a personal question sure no worries. have you had at least one or two very torrid love affairs in your life i have yes, yes. That is the Sun Pluto yep. conjunction in the fifth house, which is the house of Amor. So you you're ba you are you're you're a lover. That's who you are. <laughs> that's what you do. And love is also creativity as well. Leo's a very the fifth house is a very creative house. Now, generally speaking, uh, Le Libra tends to be a little more on the lazy side than most <laughs> signs. They don't always get a lot done, um, but they think about a lot of things. And they have great plans, Libra. But with that Sun-Pluto conjunction, you, if you were forced and you had to do something and, or you had to be creative or you had to transform circumstances in your life, 
so that creativity was a part of it, you could do it if you were forced to. So deadlines, I think, actually might be good for you with the Sun-Pluto conjunction because they would make you, you know, get things done, get it together, make it happen. Your Taurus rising and another aspect of Venus in your chart, and generally speaking, Taurus rising people, um, like with Libra on the ascendant and Taurus on the ascendant, they're generally pleasant looking people. That's the nature of Venus on the ascendant. But Taurus rising people need to work. They need to have a sense of getting things accomplished and you know, and it's in, a, in some ways, it's kind of, how do I say this? It's, it's not antithetical to a Libra because Libra's not always into work. Libra's more into ideas and taste and fashion and art and things like that. But Taurus is actually hands-on. It wants to see something tangible. Taurus rising needs things to come together. So if you can join the forces of ideas and aesthetics and art and design with things that are functional and practical and hands-on boy you 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 like really like dialed into your chart that's yeah. that's the essence of your chart you've got a lot of planets in the sixth house you've got mars which is also in libra you have the true node in scorpio uranus in scorpio you also have venus right in the cusp of the seventh house so the sixth house is work, purpose, service, and dharma, right? That's what the sixth house represents. You, my dear, you cannot do average conventional work in this lifetime, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't, not with Uranus yeah. in the sixth house. Anything yeah. you do has got to be unique, creative, and different, your own stamp. You also have Aquarius on the, on the midheaven, which in some ways is um, uh, mutually receptive to Uranus in your sixth. Now, sometimes relationships can be wildly creative or they can just be wild with that Venus-Uranus conjunction. So it's always an interesting kind of, of collaborative process for you in relationship. Um, I would try to tend to stay away from crazy people, though, long term. It could be inspirational <laughs> long term. Are you currently in a relationship right now? No, no, I'm not. No, are I'm raising my boys. Relationship? And I'm not asking for me. Are you looking to be in a relationship? No, not at all. Okay, no. Jupiter's in your seventh house. That's the house of relationships. Okay. Oh. That means when Jupiter comes to town, there's expansion and then there's opportunity. Now, relationship doesn't mean that you're going to be with another person and you're going to settle down and have a white picket fence or one of your toward love affairs. <laughs> but it does mean that there is expansion through cooperation in working with another person. And this is gonna go on for you for roughly the next year and a half. So if okay. you have any, any uh, opportunity that arises along those lines, pick it up, work on it, you know, invest in it, investigate it, because that's where Jupiter is gonna bring the magic for you. Saturn yes. is in your eighth house, and it's right in the middle of your eighth house. And you're right in the middle of one of the more intense transits in the Zodiac and Saturn through the eighth house is shamanic. And there's, there's a kind of a death process that takes place. You're about halfway through that process right now. And your Saturn's going to emerge um, in your ninth house in about two years. So you're, you got a really wide eighth house. So I don't know what's going on in your, in your life. What kind of internal sort of process or struggle you've been through, but now is a time where, at a deep level, at a psychic level, things are starting to kind of coalesce and you're, you're, you're wondering what it would be like if you theoretically had more power either financially or in your life. It's not something that's at the surface yet. You know, so I would, look, so I, would, I would look behind the scenes and try to understand kind of the, the roots of power and actually what power means to you in your life. This is a deeply investigative period and you might find clues connected to your father, your grandfather, and the patrilineal line that you come from and how they dealt with things like power. Um, but I'd say by and large, uh, the next year and a half, almost two years, is a time for you to expand and invest in partnership and relationship and collaborative efforts, okay? Wow. <laughs> you didn't hit the nail on the head. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you.
Okay. Well, you're welcome. It was nice, and, uh, nice meeting you. All right. And you thank too. You. Thank you. Yeah. I want to thank all you guys who participated today. That was really awesome. And thank you so much, uh, Robert, for doing that. And as we wrap this very long first hour <laughs> up, can you tell, uh, as we wrap the public hour up, can you tell people where they can contact you to get a reading of their own, Robert? Sure. RobertPhoenix.com. That's my website. I hang out on Facebook a lot. And I think those are the two best places to find me. Well, and Robert's, uh, of course, we, I love his uh, daily 15 minutes of flame where he uh, expands 15 minutes into about 45 and uh, <laughs> covers it all. Anyway, yeah. all right, so let's wrap up this first hour. We're going to take a little break and we'll be back with the members hour. Join us there at patreon.com forward slash off planet media. See you on the other side, guys. Thank you.